But what we're trying to do is look at the situation as a whole and then look at our piece of property and what can we do on this piece of property to affect the situation as a whole. When they were building this, everyone in the area was all up in arms about it. They said, you're taking all of our water, you can't do this, they got the police involved, they tried to do everything they could to stop it, and now they love it. Because instead of flood for one month and drought for 11, they have a consistent steady spring fed by these water retention landscapes. Because it's very important these are not with a liner, these are not with concrete, these are with earthen materials. And so it's holding the water in the body of the earth and actually feeding it back into the body of the earth. So this actually rehydrated old spring lines that at one point were a spring, probably fed by what was a wetland in this area. Now there's this big lake in this area feeding that spring. And so we're not, gonna be, we're not ever going to be able to restore all the landscape to the way it used to be. There's lots of wetlands that have been dredged, that have been developed. You're not going to rip out everyone's home and turn that back into a, land, into a wetland. And so what can we do in the areas that we can work to not only enhance that situation, but also offset this other situation? What a landscape used to be from a water perspective, and then how can we maximize that? maybe even enhance it from where it ever used to be to offset some of the other environmental degradation all around. And so it's a beautiful place. I highly recommend visiting. Uh, you know, the water level fluctuates quite a bit throughout the seasons because you're just getting one month of rainfall and then 11 months of evaporation. And s but they still have plenty of water for gardens. It's a very beautiful place. And so this was done by my mentor, Rebel Farmer, international visionary, one of my favorite human beings on the planet. A really strong, powerful guy. You know, don't get in his way with anything or you're gonna get mowed right over. And so I'm really fortunate that I get to come in after he did a lot of this backbreaking litigation and opened up these pathways, provided these successful projects so that you can just point to them. And then it makes a lot of a lo it a lot easier to convince different authorities, to convince different parties, if there's something you can point to on the landscape and say, hey, look at this, look at what they did, look at the long-term effects, now we can start to build that credibility in that long-term portfolio. This actually gives you some perspective. Ramingstein, down in here in the valley, is the, one of the coldest towns in Austria. It's called the Siberia of Austria, and they're way up here. So they're really in a, in a really cold, used to be barren landscape, but have created this beautiful oasis. And so a really important thing to think about when you're building water retention landscapes is the zones of aquaculture. These are the areas that you need to have incorporated into a water feature to have a really nice vital water feature. Now these constrictions are going to change as far as how much of the different areas you want based on climate but you always want to have these three zones in some kind of relation with each other. The first is the float zone. Anywhere where you hear water moving. These are the areas where water is being actively aerated. It's also usually going over spillways or rocks or different areas where the bacteria that clean the water are living. The movement of water actually helps provide a lot of the cleaning for the water. The next zone is the flat zone which is an area a meter, so three feet deep or less, the photic zone of the pond. This is where all of the plants are going to live. This is where the sediment is going to be combed from the water. The nutrient is going to be filtered from the water. Also a really important filter mechanism. And when you think of aquaculture, a very important area as far as producing food for the fish. So a lot of aquaculture operations are actually fish negative where they use so much fish food, they harvest more fish from the ocean than they actually produce at the end of the operation. These systems are entirely natural aquaculture systems where you're actually growing the food, so all the insects and plants and uh, small organisms and crustaceans, you're actually growing in these hot ponds, these shallow ponds, that then feed into larger systems where you have more of the fish. And so you can have these hotter ponds as also fish nurseries, but where you're bringing the water temperature up and you're really growing a lot of stuff. So in a very arid climate, you still need a flat zone, but you want to minimize it because you don't want to raise the temperature of the water too much and increase evaporation. Whereas in a cold climate, you want a lot of flat zone because you want to get that water temperature up 
to increase the activity, to increase the productivity so that you get more, <coughs> whether you want to swim in warmer water or whether you want to produce more fish, you're modifying the proportions of each of these different zones based on the climate that you're working in. Usually it's kind of a slow, steady gradient out to one meter. And you also have the deep zone, which is the third zone of aquaculture, which is where you're, I really consider this three meters or more in depth, so 10 feet or more is great, 12 feet, 15 feet. The basically, the deeper you get, the better. And what you're getting is you're getting water at its most structured. So water is most dense at four and a half degrees Celsius, about 45 degrees Fahrenheit. And so what you have happen is all of, and water has the highest oxygen holding capacity at its most dense. And it also actually takes on these beautiful crystalline structures because water is a very strong dipole. It has a strong charge, you know, it has an oxygen and two hydrogens and has a really strong positive and negative charge. So it actually develops these structures, uh, the different ways it forms. Now those structures that water holds also determine how quickly it can pass through another strong dipole, cellular membranes. And so having that reservoir of this deep charged oxygenated water actually is increasing at the rate at which life processes can happen. So it's a really key part of the system. It's also the area that in the winter, all of the fish are going to migrate down to that deep zone where they have access to oxygen, they have a warmer temperature. And then in the summer, when it's way too hot at the top and oxygen levels are low, they're again going to migrate down into those deep zones where they have enough oxygen, where they have that cool charged water. Um, and then you also get overturn where basically every year, twice a year, when the water cools or warms up to that temperature, you get the mixing of all the water. It's very important to have a lot of textured habitat to provide areas for different things to hide out from the fish food to the small fish. So if you have a perfectly circular pond, you're going to have good water circulation throughout the area, but what's going to happen is you have no texture for the small fish to hide out in. And so you're only going to be able to have one size of fish because the big fish are going to eat the smaller fish until there are no more, until they exhaust them. Whereas having all of these textured areas, places for things to hide out, now you can start to have a more natural water system where you have different sizes of fish. So. The more varied, the more natural, the better. You actually want to provide areas where water is flowing through more and areas where it's flowing through less and provide as many different options for habitat as possible. So it's not that there's a set shape. You do want to avoid corners. You do want to avoid just having a circular open pond. But really, you want to work as much as possible with the shape of the landscape that's there. So you're moving as little earth as you need to to get the job done and you're getting a nice natural curvy shape.